Welcome to Sports Opinion, the weekly sports talk show on Channel 18. My name's Dirk Keller. This is Bob Boyd. That's Earl Murphy, as always. And we have got a very special guest here today, Nate Kading. Now with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, right. yeah. West High, All-State, University of Iowa All-American. Nate is here to talk to us about a very special project has taken on and uh, it's called the Red Zone Academy. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. If you read the Press Citizen today, it's on the front page of the paper and it's quite a story. Uh, Pat Hardy did that with you, correct? correct. Yep. And uh, uh, we're going to have Pat Hardy on the show later uh, this summer. Earl doesn't know that yet, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about that later. But today we're going <clears> to <throat> talk about Nate Kading. I think the first thing I want to talk about um, before we get into the red zone, your time at West High, mm -hmm. you had a really special experience there. Your senior year, you won three state championships, first in football, mm -hmm. then in basketball, and then in soccer. And I don't know, were there any other West High students that were on all three teams? I don't think there were on those three. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, you hit it on the head. It was a pretty neat experience for me all along. It was a storybook sort of. Sort of ride, but um, and like we were talking about before the show, we, we I was blessed to, to uh, been working under a lot of great coaches there, Reese Morgan and mm -hmm. and Steve Bergman, who continues to pile on state championships and wins, and uh, we had a great Matt Wilkerson was our soccer coach, so it was a all in all just a, a great experience. But uh, we had a lot of a lot of great kids I grew up with playing a lot of rec league sports and club sports, whether it be soccer or basketball, uh, and then football as we got into junior high. So we all grew up together, and then we all kind of. You know, saw it, saw it to the end uh, through the high school career, and it was uh, it was a neat experience. Well, and no other high school had done that before either. Football, championship, yeah. basketball, championship, and soccer, right? Yeah, I think that was uh, yeah. one of the one of the first goes, especially in 4A, and we were, yes. we were rocking and rolling West High, in, especially in the last two or three years, has kept the uh, kept that tradition alive. They're they're rattling off state titles like it's nothing. Uh, yeah, and it's it's pretty neat to watch, but uh, you know, especially that. Uh, basketball team, boys basketball team they had last year, and then going back the year before, two undefeated seasons in a row is is remarkable. And um, it really is. And Coach Coach Bergman is the driving force. <laughs> well, now you were on Coach Bergman's second state team. Correct. Yep. And I really think that your class, your senior class that year, really set the the pace for football and basketball and soccer, both boys and girls too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After you, uh, I mean, it, it's just amazing. What West High has accomplished, <clears throat> even after down periods, whether it be football or soccer, you know, baseball, whatever, West High continues to rise to the occasion. Last year was no exception. Uh, the year be both the boys and girls won state titles. Right. Yeah. The volleyball team won a state title mm -hmm. both years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm not sure what soccer did, but uh, the boys soccer yeah. sprinkled another one or two. They got, in there. They, yeah. they have three in a row there. Yep. They that it, not this past school year, but the year before but, they won. Yeah. I forget how many state titles, mm -hmm. but you, <laughs> you were the first to do three of them on one you know, on your own, if mm -hmm. you will. not on your own, but in one season, eight titles. And I just think that it's really remarkable, and it's got to be something you'll never forget. No, it was. Uh, Did we, uh, uh, lose any games at all? Oh yeah, we lost. We we rattled off quite a few losses. Our basketball team lost more than we should have. We had Glenn Worley was our uh, yeah our our starting center, and he was the he was the go to guy. He he scored all the points. We just did a lot of passing up to him. But uh, we lost a few basketball games there. I think we might have lost our first soccer game of the season, but then we won the rest of them. But football, we won uh, twenty six and zero our junior year. So we, <laughs> wow, a lot, a lot of good talent. Yeah. Did you play Definitely any not. position on in football besides kicker? I played a little bit of free safety, but not a whole lot. Yeah. I punted the ball a little bit, too. We were, we were kind of thin in that position, so. Well, yeah, any interceptions? Wanna... No. <laughs> well, batted one down against City High, though, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Might, yeah. Should have been an interception, but. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I got toasted on a few plays, too, I'm sure. Well, well. We, we saw what happened to you when you tried to tackle in the NFL, yeah, and it's not funny. No, it, not at all. Very lot. first play of the very first game of the season, oh. opening kick. Done for the year. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I can still see that visual. I know you can too. But I, oh, my heart just went out to you and your family. It just tore me up. Yeah, it's. I, I got no business out there trying to chase down one of some of those guys. They got returning kicks, but uh, you try to either be a speed bump or get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> one of the two. Well, I admired your heart going after yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> that competitive spirit. Yeah. You just. I I feel that uh, Reese Morgan was one of the best coaches that. 
West, I, oh yeah, I think he's one, yeah. of, the, and, one and, of the best coaches in the and, state ever. I, any sport. Absolutely, and he's yeah. uh, he's been a great mentor to me, and I was lucky because uh, the year I graduated from West High and signed at Iowa was the same year that he went from the West High head coach yep. on the coach at, at the university. So I was yes. lucky to have eight consecutive years with Reese, and you, you'd you be hard-pressed to find a better yeah. human being than him. He's Tell us a little bit about Reese. We don't know <clears throat> Reese that well. The viewers don't know him that mm-hmm. well. He's still with the Iowa football coaching staff. Absolutely. He's yeah. He's been there ever since uh, 2000. Just, uh, yeah. Salt of the earth, blue collar, uh, teaches coaches uh, the importance of, the of same, hard work. The same way, the, ab- absolutely, the same way same every day. Way. Wake up, have your routine, yeah. put in yeah. the put in the work. He, you know, he was when he was the you know students at West. I'd always come up to you at lunchtime and say, hey, "Look what I brought to lunch: just brown, a brown paper bag with a <clears throat> white bread and a little, one piece of turkey and maybe an apple or something." You know, it's just uh, punch <laughs> punch the time clock. Bring your bring your work pill to to work and, and get get the job done and you know, that's what he taught you the practice with a purpose be there show up be a teammate do things the right way and that, that's what he's all about now yeah. he came to west high from benton, benton community. community that's right yeah and was that his first head coaching job do you know i believe it was i believe benton community was his first and then of course when he came to west high the team had one of the longest losing records oh uh, yes didn't have their own stadium yet i think it was maybe a year or two in yeah, yeah. that's right when they got when they built their stadium and that's right he yeah. built that thing from the ground came up. Came through. Yeah, yeah. And Tom <laughs> Lepic came through, built the stadium, and uh, so yeah. did you get to play on West High's field? Yeah, I you played did. there. I was there from '97 through 2000. I think when was the stadium built? Maybe '94. I don't, I don't it, know. It's been that long ago now. Jeez, I'm probably. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I, yeah, no, wow. Now they have a new soccer field too. Yeah, yeah soccer field's beautiful. Yeah. I was out there for their <clears throat> game a couple nights Did ago. Did you go? It's great. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with foul balls over the over the <laughs> the backstop there when <laughs> baseball season cranks up. Just hope they're not playing at the same time. I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't know. That's tough. Um, Reese Morgan at West High and then at Iowa. You become an All American kicker at Iowa and get drafted in the. Third round. Third round. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't take kickers in no. the first round too often. <laughs> Not much. That was, was pretty it? high for a kicker at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Sebastian round? Janikowski, Jan, I think, was the yeah. only one ever to go in the first round. Yeah. That being a good pick because he's, he's been rocking and rolling now for about yeah. 15 years. I remember the old St. Louis football Cardinals took a punter in the first round. Oh, did they? Years ago. That's not and that didn't turn out well. a punter. <laughs> and that okay. didn't work out well. Unless your name's Reggie Roby, that's not Yeah, I think, right. Not yeah. Recommended. I think his name was Little, if I'm not mistaken. Did Reggie go? What round? I'm sure he had to get drafted, but not that high. He did get drafted. He, he was drafted. But uh, I don't recall the round either. Yeah. So <clears throat> you become an All-American kicker at Iowa and are Mr. Reliable, Mr. Dependable. And you head off to the NFL after being drafted by the San Diego Chargers. Mm-hmm. Paradise here in America. Anyway. <laughs> and tell us a little about, you were there, I want to say, eight years, seven yeah, years? Yeah, nine years. Nine years yeah. at San Diego. Um, counting the, the half year last year. That counts. Um, yeah. yeah. We'll take it. <laughs> it's quite a town, isn't it? It is a neat town, especially being an oh. Iowa boy, born and raised. The weather out there is fantastic. Almost, yeah, yeah. Like, perfect like you're in weather. A fairy tale every day. You almost start begging for some rain. Really, yeah. <laughs> seventy degrees and sunny. You hope for a little yeah. bit of variety. But yeah. now, did you get to play with Tim Dwight out there? Like, Tim was out there in my first year. That's what I thought. And then he went on to I think New England. Yeah. Now think like, about that. Iowa City boys. Well, Coralville, yeah. and Iowa City, mm-hmm. on one team yeah. in San Diego. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were going to say no, something that's pretty, about No, we Tim. had a bunch of Hawkeyes kind of cycling through there. Oh, Mike yeah, Goff was Mike there. Goff. And, um, mm-hmm. Dave, uh, Derek Robinson and a few guys, that uh, Scott Chandler. Um, so we had a bunch kind of coming in and out of there. You see more and more of them popping up. All yeah. right, now we've had Timmy Dwight on our show before. What was it like in the locker room in the NFL with Tim Dwight? I mean, as he is, just yeah. an energetic guy, a good, vibrant personality, and you know he's always been known to be a guy that trains at a at a different level, and you can see that certainly. He got oh, yeah. takes really good care of his body and works hard at it, and uh, yeah, yeah, he's a great player. Did he ever run any? kickoffs back on you in practice <laughs> i'm sure he did <laughs> probably a few of them but yeah. uh, we had actually wes welker was in training camp that same year with yeah. with tim and they actually kept tim <laughs> over wes as the return guy is that tim right was like in his second or third year out in san diego um and uh, i think if they look back on it, they probably wish they could have kept kept wes and tim on the roster that's one you let go yeah but uh but no he's yeah very what a career he's had in new england with, Bobby Elliott, with the san diego for a while Bob Elliott was out at uh, San Diego State with Chuck Long. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. With, for yeah. three or four years, he went out at the same time that I was out. Yeah. Did you ever run into those guys? Oh, yeah, they came out to practice quite a bit. Yeah. 
Yeah, checked in. Uh, What's your practice routine like yes. uh, on a daily basis when you're in the season, Nate? Well, get up, go to the golf course. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. then, then, then rub another player, <laughs> studying plays and lifting weights. No, I mean, it's been about a good hour and a half working out, training, um, mm -hmm. you know, keeping the body stretched and flexible and strong. And then, you know, during practice, it might be a two-hour practice. You might spend, you know, 30 minutes actually kicking and the rest of it's yeah. – Kind of just by time talking with guys. If you maybe jump in to help out on a scout team or something every now and then, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of downtime as a kicker. That's one of the bigger challenges yeah. is just trying to yeah. find something productive to do with all your time. I, I thought that yeah, this is a question at quarterback club. Club, uh, you, you you kick this ball the same way every time. Yeah, you do, and that's the. I, I get, never realized that. You get asked that a lot. Technique, because you see golfers taking little half swings and uh, from mm -hmm. different shots. But yeah. kicking, you, you really want it to be as simple as possible. So yeah. whether you're kicking an extra point, a 20 yarder, or a 60 yarder at the end of the game to win, it's yeah. the same motion every single time. Just keep it as simple as possible. And so all those extra points that you see flying into the net, in theory, those things should be flying 65 yards because you're kicking that the exact same way you would a long field goal. Really? Yeah. And what about kickoffs? Kickoffs, uh, yeah, same, you're just booting that sucker as far as you can. <laughs> but it's the same motion, the same? A little bit different motion. Hey, you're, I mean, now we're getting in a lot of kicker jargon, but yeah, you're, no, you're landing on a, you know, a, a different foot. You know, the field goal, you're doing a skip step, so you're landing on your plant foot as you follow through. Kickoffs, to get more momentum, you just really take what they call a hurdler step, so you kick, and then you actually land mm -hmm. on the foot that you kicked with. Um, so just okay. trying to get a little bit more, more go through the ball. When did you start kicking? I mean, yeah. when did you really start? I didn't start kick uh, really until about freshman year of high school. Really? We did it seventh and eighth grade at, at Northwest Junior High. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you don't kick extra points there, so uh, you know, I just kind of kicked off and just did yeah. it messing around. And then, but I played soccer growing up, along with every other sport that was out sure. there. Uh, that's kind of where you get the that kicking motion from a little bit. And then mm -hmm. when I got into high school, I just started picking it up and played varsity as a sophomore and. Just really liked it. I liked the idea of dropping 50 balls out there for practice, and if one day 35, why can't you come out the next day and make 40? And <laughs> yeah. Just that sort of competitiveness and the, and the challenge of it day to day was was fun. Did you punt in high school? I did punt in high school, yeah. So and I, I, if I remember right, you <clears throat> punted some at Iowa. I did punt at Iowa my sophomore year. We David Bradley, a good friend of mine, uh -huh. uh, he he was a redshirt freshman. He he punted, but they had me punt the ones backed up in the end zone just to kind of give him a little bit of really? confidence boost to not have to handle the some of the hard ones. I only had yeah. like six, seven, eight punts in my career. So at Iowa, what's your most memorable kick? Probably the Alamo Bowl game winner. Um, just because that was, you know, getting the mm. – came in, it was – my first year was Kirk's second year, and we'd only – they'd only won one game prior. And that, our, my first year we had only won, I think, two or three games. And then <coughs> we finally got back to the bowl game and being able to win that really felt like that propelled mm -hmm. us on through the, you know, the next two years, which were great. And, you know, the, the junior yeah. year being the BCS game at the Orange Bowl. and I was, was there. Fun experience. Who was that game against? The Orange Bowl was against USC. No, the Alamo Bowl. Alamo Bowl was Texas Tech. Yeah. Cliff, Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury. Cliff Kingsbury. And, yeah. I remember a game up at Madison, and I think it was, I can't remember now, it was your junior or senior year, and we got off to a bad start, down a couple touchdowns. We really came back in the second quarter, and you you had a field goal attempt. They called timeout with, yeah. uh, right at the end of the first half, and they yep. were trying to freeze you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you, you know, then they called a second time out. You remember that? Yeah, it might have literally froze me because it was like a th it was forty a degrees morning, and yeah. rainy and windy. And yeah, Barry was called. He called two timeouts. Two timeouts, we, and we, then you got up and kicked about a fifty-yard yeah, halftime yep. with the moment. That was a fun one too. That, that was, was a good game. game. Yeah, I was. We were there. Uh, <laughs> I said, "This is a good effect." <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting there, you know, wanting to believe. Yeah, that's right. Sure yeah. enough, you kicked it right through. <laughs> um, so. <clears throat> Barry Alvarez was quite a guy. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Right? A long time. And he had a big smile on his face yeah. when he ran out of that Rose Bowl this year. You could tell him the opportunity to get back out there and coach. Oh, yes. Now, um, okay, so you graduate from Iowa. You get drafted by the San Diego Chargers, and you head out there again to paradise. And then all you did was proceed to become the most accurate field goal kicker in the history of the NFL. That's all. 
<laughs> yeah, it was you know the NFL is a different different challenge. You know, it's it's a longer season and it's a uh, it's <laughs> there's a lot more chances to do good things and chances to do bad things. And uh, you know, you kind of you got to be able to ride the highs and lows a little bit better than college, where the season you're in and out of there mm -hmm. uh, pretty quick. But it was. Uh, all in all, a good experience, and you know, it's the fun thing I like about the sport that still wakes me up each morning is knowing that I can get better and improve and continue yeah. to chase, chase the <clears throat> that title, which I haven't been able to to get accomplished yet either. Um, but it, it, it's fun. It's, a, it's always a challenge. There's no doubt about that. Are you healthy now, Nate? I am healthy, and, and it's been a big issue of mine here the last couple of years. Like Dirk said, I blew yeah. my knee out a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> to start the season of opening kickoff of the year and it's been a bit of a challenge back from that just to get the whole body back working again and taking on the volume of kicking for that long. Is your knee, is it kicking a knee or? My knee I uh, injured was my plant knee, my left knee. Okay. Yeah. Then I've had some muscle issues in my right leg last year and I feel like I've gotten those pretty much Good. cured mm -hmm. and dialed in. And well, ready. you made a lot of San Diego Charger fans here in Iowa City. <laughs> That's true. I mean, yeah. you did. Uh, the nice thing, you know, we didn't always get the Charger games on, but the odds are pretty good because it was always, you know, usually you were playing the late game on mm -hmm. Sunday, and it was always something a lot of us looked forward to, was to good. seeing you kick and then, you know, kind of bragging on you a little bit. <laughs> uh, Everybody here knew what Nate was doing. You know, yeah. Everybody kept up, that's for sure. Well, and, you know, your family has been in Coralville for a long time. Mm -hmm. I told you... Uh, last night on the phone, I worked with your mom. In fact, I've worked with your brother and sister. I've, I've known your father for a while. Your mom just retired. Yeah, yeah 29 years with the city. Wow. Well, yep. there isn't a better family in this community, plain and simple. And it, they just really are part of the fabric of the, well, I'm going to, you know, the Coralville community. Uh, you were born and raised in Coralville, and and I know you take pride in that. Um, in fact, yeah. I'm going to, yeah. after this, I've got to, Take Kelly Hayworth and Mayor Jim Fawcett out to record some radio commercials. Uh -oh. uh, uh, I'm a I'm a big fan of the those guys and the city of Coralville and the way things and did a great job. And your mom yeah, the city's and your dad were a big part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a, a big takeaway for me as I look back on my professional career and where I came from is that I really am a product of this community in a lot of ways. And um, you know all the all the different people and the organizations and the school district and. Mm -hmm parents of friends that I played sports with or grew up with and I mean it, it, I was lucky I mean with, without growing up here I certainly with my limited physical ability I know I wouldn't have gotten where I would have gotten but I was I'm fortunate to have been developed in a, in a community like this where a lot of people care about you and they do it the right way and they instill the right values in you and I know I wouldn't have been able to get to where I got without without being a part of this yeah there's no doubt about that yeah well then San Diego does the unthinkable <laughs> midway through the season after you've been injured they cut you, and I know it's who's a business. It, who's, who's yeah. the San, the San uh, it's a local business person out there, the Spanos family. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they cut you, <laughs> and you get to go home. Yeah, it was baby girl about two weeks after I got oh, boy. released from from San Diego. So it was it wasn't it wasn't all bad timing. Yeah. It was a silver lining <laughs> yeah. there a little yeah. bit, but um, yeah, I injured my groin. Started out the season great, had good the first three games, and then ended up injuring my groin in practice. Um, and then rehabbed it and got back to a point where I thought I could continue, but the numbers weren't. They had some receivers get injured. You can only carry some people on the on the roster. I wasn't quite ready yet, so they had to had to move on. And it was uh, certainly tough after nine years and um, being in the same place and having a lot of good relationships. But that's the nature of the business. I know that I was on the long end of the spectrum yeah. in terms of being in one place for nine years and then lucky to to jump on with Miami at the end of the year. And and that was <clears throat> you told the story at the Monday Morning Quarterback Club about. <laughs> getting the phone call from your agent that you need to go to Miami. I thought maybe you'd share that with our viewers here today. Yeah, it's a funny story. I was sitting there on the barber chair, literally. Um, it was a Thursday at about 10 a.m., and Christmas was the next Monday. And you're and still in San Diego? Still in San Diego. Okay. Great. The newborn, not even a month old. I was sitting there, uh, get a call from my agent saying they just got a call from Miami. They really want you. You want to fly down there. You haven't played since you've been injured, so we just want to make sure that, that you're healthy. We'll bring another guy in and do a little tryout tomorrow morning and then you'll play in the game on Sunday and knowing that I had a lot of Iowa ties down there and Joe Philbin who is the offensive mm, yeah, line coach yeah. when I was here uh, of course Ken O'Keefe offensive coordinator good friend of our family mm. uh, Charlie Bolin who's an assistant D-line coach he was a graduate assistant here for the last four or five years oh really so I got to know him pretty well and uh, and you know me personally said come on down we really want you uh, we got two more games left of the season have a chance of making the playoffs I'm like, well, it's an easy sell for me, but I don't know how my wife is going to feel about yeah. this being out in California with a newborn baby and 
two little crazy boys at home as yeah. well. Uh, so I had to do some little, some coaxing with her and finally convinced her that it was a good good career move to head out there and, and give a shot at it and get back on get back on the playing field after being injured. Miami really. still had a shot at the playoffs then. They did. They had to win the <clears throat> first game uh, that Sunday. It's been a little bit of help after that right. game, and then if we went up to New England and would have won, we would have would have had a chance. But didn't, yeah. didn't you kick a game winner for Miami? I kicked. Uh, a field goal late in the game that helped. I didn't kick a game winner, okay, though. Okay, okay. Um, I think we handled Buffalo one by 17 points or so. I think yeah. I watched that yeah. game. But the funny story from that is they fly out. I'm on a red-eye flight. Hadn't really slept much. <laughs> kick well in the tryout. Make the team. And it's whole, kind of like a blur. After nine years in one place, yeah. now I'm going through this crazy whirlwind to get out there and play in a game yeah. 48 hours after being signed and to the stadium on Sunday, and I leave my wallet back at the hotel. Oh. I'm checking in about 10, 10 miles down the, the freeway towards the stadium. I'm like, ah, it's no big deal. I don't really need it. You don't need your ID or cash or really anything on game day. So I'm just I'm driving through, and right out in front of the Orange Bowl where the stadium is at, there's a toll. <laughs> I've never seen this before in my life, a toll right that close to a stadium. So I, I pull up, and it's a, I had 85 cents in the cup holder for my trip to Dunkin' Donuts on Friday morning. <laughs> but the toll is a dollar. So I get up, get up to the toll, and I go to the back. There's a van right behind us of a bunch of dolls in there. So I go back and panhandle 15 cents to get into the stadium <laughs> to go play in an NFL game. It so it was, a, it, was yeah. a, it was a good story. I told Coach Phil about that after we won, and he got a kick out of it. But yeah. it, it, was, it was a good experience. So how was the coach? He's great. He's uh, very detail oriented. Runs a runs a tight ship, but all the guys seem to respect him. He had a real bad. Uh, uh, his son committed suicide. I don't think he. Yeah, I don't know if he committed committed suicide. I think he. He had a tragic that, death yeah, of some. He some drowned sort in up the in, river up Wisconsin. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, you call it what you want. I yeah. Um, wow. Is that right? I, I never did oh. hear the final yeah. outcome, but yeah, the result was. A devastated family, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and then he's you know Joe is trying to. He was still with the Packers, and it was playoff time. Yeah, and I think he took the Miami job not soon thereafter. Right after that, yeah. You know? I mean, it was wow. I don't so did he just complete his? <clears throat> he's completed his first year. First year, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. And wow. they got really good support from. Them. They've made yeah. a lot of big moves in free agency this year and spent some money on some people. So I think they'll. They'll have a good chance to compete. The only downside is they have New England in their division, yeah. which always handcuffs you a little yeah. bit. You got it's a big hurdle to get mm -hmm. over. Did you watch the TV show on HBO called Hard Knocks yeah. last year, mm -hmm. which they featured the whole season, the Miami Dolphins? Mm -hmm. That's you know for those of us who are novices to the NFL, it was really insightful, and there was an awful lot of Joe Philbin mm -hmm. on there, and it shows in his office when he's got to cut people. And there's some discipline <laughs> issues which right. they take in, and I thought Joe was really even-handed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just never saw him lose his mind, and um, <laughs> I have to believe it'd be hard to keep your sanity when you're a head coach in the NFL. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many characters. Yeah, a lot of pressure, and there's not really a whole lot of uh, uh, restrictions on these guys. No. Um, so how do you get from? Miami, Nate, uh, how's how that process all work? So there's always a lot of politics and economics and everything yeah. involved in every team's decision in terms of their personnel. And, uh, you know, we, we were in Miami, you only signed the contract through that year. So yes. we went and hit free agency and then had some discussions with them as to whether I was a good fit. They have a, a kicker that's been a long-time guy right. there in Miami, and um, they decided to go with a younger guy in the draft to come in and compete with their existing guy. So... That left me out there, and then pursued a bunch of different options, and then ended up uh, getting a phone call from Tampa about two weeks. That ended up being the best opportunity for me. That's um, yeah. some familiar staff down there, some connections with Coach Turner, um, and some folks like that. And it's, it'll be a good opportunity to go back and get a lot of good work in this August. And I'll be there competing with a guy that's been kicking there for a few years. But um, I mean, that's, get him. The, that's the nature nature of my position in any position in the yeah. NFL. It's a, yeah, that's right. it's a competitive business, and you have to prove yourself year in and year out. And unfortunately for me, I've only played six or seven games the last two seasons uh, battling through some of these injuries and just got a hopefully a situation where you take one step back to take two steps forward and <clears throat> pop, go to work and see see where it takes me so this will be your 10th season right coming correct up? yep 10th yeah. season coming up now, do you, did you keep your house in San Diego did you sell we it? didn't we uh, rented just a fun house the last couple of years we were down yeah. there so we were able to make a, a good clean break and oh, good. Um, good yeah you don't want to be stuck with the California mm. property too yeah, long because they're yeah, that's right. they're not cheap no and so <laughs> when does when do you have to report to training camp for Tampa Bay so each NFL team is allotted I think it's 30 35 off-season workouts including a camp so we'll start down there April 15th kind of come back and forth between there and Iowa City 
uh, participate in their off-season workouts, and then we have a good six months off before we start training camp the third week really? in July. So we'll be back here about June 10th, spend the spend the summer back here in Iowa City. So the family goes with you. They'll too? come out. Kids will be in preschool here. Uh -huh. I'll kind of come back and forth between the time they're done. Then we'll probably spend two weeks rent just a fun beach house or something out there in Tampa as I go through the end of mini camp and the off season workouts, yeah. and then uh, maybe hit Disney World or something up while I'm out there over a weekend, and then we're all fly back here to Iowa. Yeah. Now. <clears throat> Have you played in Tampa Bay Stadium before? We played the Outback Bowl there, and I played uh, one yeah. NFL game. So I've got a couple different experiences. It's a good stadium. It's the Tampa sits a little bit off the ocean, so you don't get as much wind as you might uh, in, in like in Miami or some of these other coastal cities. And obviously, the temperature's great. And yeah. Mm -hmm. How's the surface? Surface is regular grass, like a Bermuda it grass. Is. Yeah. Which is good. I prefer to prefer to kick off the grass unless there's a dome over my head. Yeah, yeah. Well, then I'll yeah. take that over the grass. You had grass in uh, grass San Diego. Diego. Uh -huh. And what did Miami have? Miami was grass as well. It was. Yeah. Well, when you were looking, I was kind of hoping you did, but you end up in Green Bay. I'm a Packer fan. <laughs> you know what? I probably you probably wouldn't want to kick up there, would you? Yeah, that's a that's a frozen oh, man. <clears throat> yeah, well, Green Bay or Chicago, those are two difficult places to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm gonna. We're all gonna be following you uh, with Tampa Bay this year, and again, you've created a whole bunch of new Buccaneer fans here Great. in Iowa City and Coralville. And well, there are a lot of people that admire you and and want to follow you all the way through. Um, uh, Does Tampa Bay uh, have a chance to be a contender, Nate? You think? I think they do. They got a lot of good energy there. Um, I think they they ended up having a surprise season last mm -hmm. year where they won. Yeah. Uh, I think they were over 500. Uh, you know, they got. Just not unlike Miami, they have some good teams in the division they have to compete with, with Atlanta and um, New Orleans. It's always always tough. So it's a competitive league, but I think they're headed in the right direction. Yeah, uh, fun. Yeah. Gonna be fun. And it's another warm weather. Uh, <laughs> you have really. I'm getting paid back the market. for my first 21 years living in Iowa. <laughs> <time>. <laughs> But you still weather. choose to live here. Uh, in yeah, the no, I was, might have been the only NFL player to to winter in Iowa. Yeah, <laughs> coming, especially coming from San Diego. But not bad. It's still home. We, right? Exactly. <clears throat> well, uh, one of the things that you have undertaken is a brand new project called the Red Zone Academy. Mm -hmm. You spoke to our lunch group to go about the safety for youth football players, and especially specifically concerned with head injuries. Mm -hmm. And I know we talked on the phone. I've got a boy in sixth grade who has finished two years of tackle football at Regina. And I thought the Press Citizen article today was really interesting because, uh, among other coaches, you've got Marv Cook's feedback on mm -hmm. it. It sounds like, other than, uh, uh, what's his name out at West Branch, uh, you've got all these coaches He's, in the area. Yeah, mm -hmm. Butch. Uh, you've got all the coaches on your side. Yeah, I think it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And it, it wasn't really a, an undertaking where I was trying to push them one way or the other. I, I, I wanted to kind of dive into the issue a little bit. It's a hot button topic in the NFL locker rooms these days. And I think just nationally, and the media is covering a lot more of how the game should be introduced to the area, mm -hmm. youth, to the youngsters. And I wanted to, to pick their brains. They're the experts. I mean, you got the coach Saber, literally dedicated his entire professional life to coaching and teaching what a guy young football is. players and yeah. and marv cook who played professionally and now he's back coaching and and all these guys in the community we, we have a lot of great football minds i want to get their opinion what do they feel like is the best the best tack to take with these kids and um, i was just surprised to see that not a lot of them really stood behind a lot of these tackle leagues i think there's a more uh productive thought out way to introduce the game a especially to the second third fourth graders and then to teach some tackles in the physicality of the game in the fifth and sixth grade level as they lead up into the junior high system where then they get introduced to the to the tackle and in those systems yeah. um, and i think that it's uh the the viability of the game going forward is really in jeopardy i mean the, this concussion issue isn't going away um, it's at the NFL level, especially. It's you know they've got billion dollar lawsuits on their hands. Mm -hmm. That's going to trickle down into into kids and making sure that it's it's safe for them. And um, and the, and all the the folks running the youth tackle football programs, they've taken numerous measures to make things as it can for the kids. But for me, the overarching objectives for any youth sport, not alone just football, are a let's have it be fun. B let's have it be really active. And see, let's just instruct the kids the right way, uh, teach them the skills that they need to develop, and then deliver them into their junior high and high school programs as as competent football players. And none of those three 
uh, get jeopardized by taking the pads off. You can still accomplish all these things in a safer environment without having the pads and worrying about these these cumulative effect concussions that everybody's talking about these days. How old or what grade were you when you first put on pads and a helmet? I was uh, seventh grade. We didn't seventh have grade. tackle football right. anywhere in Iowa City until, yeah. man, it must have been just five or five, ten years ago, I think, yeah. when, when these tackle football leagues started. And um, I, I, I'm adamant about the fact that, you know, people say, oh, they're going to be less equipped to be good tacklers. What if they started in third grade? They're going to be better football players than they're practicing it. Well, I mean, there's zero evidence that, that speaks towards that. And, um, you know, all these Iowa, Iowa City football teams had a lot of success prior to when they started up without right. ever having to deal with that. And I think that we can, like I said, teach, teach some of these tackling skills in a more controlled environment while they're in fifth and sixth grade. So that way they get delivered into the seventh grade programs as even better tacklers than they would have if they just get the pad slapped on them as nine-year-olds and just start running around trying to tackle each other. You know, uh, Marv Cook made a good point in the Press Citizen article today. He said the youth leagues... Helmets only come in two sizes, small and large. They don't fit properly, mm -hmm. which is really how you protect the head when you put a helmet mm -hmm. on. Um, <clears throat> I also thought Bump Elliott had a really interesting observation. Uh, earlier this season, we were talking with Bump at lunch, and he said, you know, one way to help alleviate a lot of the head injuries is take the face mask off the right. helmets. That's mm -hmm. right. You're not going to stick your head in there like an idiot, if you will, if you don't have something protecting your face. He said, we didn't have that kind of problem Yeah, uh, like they do. <clears throat> and I know head injuries really hit home for you because your teammate, Junior Seau, mm -hmm. didn't just, well, he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty common assumptions uh, across the NFL that it was because of head injuries. Right. Uh, you and I've read that nobody saw this coming. Nobody saw him acting like you might think someone with severe concussion syndrome. Mm -hmm. He was the team leader. He was the the local boy done well in San Diego. Right. And it just if you want, if you would, please talk about uh, Junior Seau and how that all impacted you. Yeah, it's a, it was a a huge, probably the biggest sports story ever in San Diego. He was uh, you know local. Born and raised guy, vibrant personality, um, never really showed a whole lot of signs of depression to anyone and uh, you know, committed suicide and his family's recently donated his brain to science as they continue to, to do the research that have played professionally for 10 plus years on the, the cumulative effect of knocking your head against someone over and over and over again for, you know, if he started playing football at the age of 12, then that's, that's a, you know, 20 plus years of, yeah. of doing that, uh, that sort of, that sort of action. And the, the brain just isn't built to, to withstand that sort of impact. And, um, you know, and that's a con ongoing discussion um, in the NFL is, and I think that us as players that get compensated very well for what we do, we have to understand the risk that we take. And maybe it's yeah. if, if it's step the game a few years earlier and being able to, to, to function cognitively correctly, <clears throat> that's what we all need to make that conscious decision. Let's be a little smarter with our money. And if we need to step away after playing eight years, we don't need to play 18. Maybe we can uh -huh. just just move on. But um, yeah, and, and I think that they, they're, they're at the just the beginning, the precipice here of really learning more about it. Um, and a junior sale case isn't something that we necessarily want to equate to Johnny or Jack going to play football at, at when they're eight or nine. Um, that, that we're talking about two different worlds, but I think that we have to step back and just take a comprehensive look at, at exactly what, what, what is the best tact and approach to take on how we introduce the game to everybody. Well, in we your, your uh, elementary school, you're talking about third uh, through sixth grade with your red zone league, right? Correct. Can you explain how they would be equipped with the flags? There are the three flags, do they have a helmet? With moving forward, what what would the kids have on as equipment? So we're going to take the next uh, four months, and I'm I'm going to the folks that are actually run the Red Zone Football League, and it's in association with NFL Flag. So each each kid that registers an NFL jersey that the NFL has, so they sponsor this league, and they they send you their own belt with the flags on it, and really? it's part of the USA Football, which is the national okay. governing body. So that's a, that's a pretty neat aspect of it too, but. We're going to spend the next three or four months and really developing uh, just an age-based curriculum. So we're going to take a step back. We're going to talk to all the players here in the community, mm -hmm. all the all the the coaches, the high school coaches, people that have been involved in all the different youth leagues, tackle, 
all the recreational flag leagues, parents that like Dirk, whose kids have gone through the leagues. Yeah. Well, let's get a curriculum here. What, what are 30 good drills that a third grader should do? What are 30 that a sixth grader should do? Mm -hmm. What are the objectives that we're trying to accomplish within each? Just like if you're going to teach history to a third grader, you're going to do it in a different way than you're going to teach a sixth grader, but you're going to do it in a creative way that's engaging and that it, they're actually teaching. You're accomplishing the same things, but instead of just showing them a textbook, maybe you have some sort of creative lesson plan that you're going to do. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to talk to all the main uh, advocates and the people that, that have an interest in, in football in the community and we're going to find the best way to, to teach the game and, in a way that, that the kids enjoy and that's 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 the main point. We're, we're going to develop this curriculum so we can hand that off to, to the parent volunteer coaches and we're going to have some certified uh, professional coaches at the, at the top of the ranks that can kind of go around and make sure these drills are being implemented and um, and just take a comprehensive approach but that's a good point. I, one of the big arguments and that I would like to see happen down the road maybe not in the first year but as we kind of get this thing growing is um, are there different equipment options so it's not a full padded thing maybe it's just like shells which are shoulder yeah. for pads that the kids can get fitted for better helmets so let's get the kids in the pads before they just dive right into seventh grade football at the you, junior high you got to do something or else they're in trouble yeah they can't just drop them right into the into the cult. is there yeah. a way to sort of progress mm, properly sure. towards towards the seventh and eighth grade and i would also like to say that the the physical part of the game is to me, it's is great. I mean, that, that's kind of that's what separates. That's <laughs> yeah, what makes that's football right. football. That's right. yeah, that's we're not right. we're not yeah. trying to wussify that or no. play the game <laughs> with pillows on our hand or something like that. I, we're, we're, I'm just talking about more of a tactful <laughs> kind of approach <laughs> to to make it safer yeah. and uh, yes. for the young people. And I think that's a, what we all have the same interest. Whether you're participating in a youth tackle league or a flag league or Do you know how many injuries they were in high school football last year, all classes. It's a great question. I do know the one stat I know off the top of my head is that every year in the United States there's four million sports and recreation related concussions. Wow. Over half of those are football. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Let's just say that again. Mm. Four million sports. Yeah, any sport and recreation concussions. So any sport. Concussions. And I think it's like 2.2 .2 million of those are football. So you have yeah. every sport wow. that that includes skiing and snowboarding and mm -hmm. skateboarding and professional football. But over half. Nuts. Of yeah, football, football any, at any level, yeah. yeah. Which is it, so you have this dangerous combination, in my opinion. Of a, for, on one hand, you have the most popular sport in America, highest participated, most watched, mm -hmm. most beloved, and then you also have the most dangerous. Yes, yeah. it's, it's a it's a challenging sort of trick that we're wow. that we're trying to trying to work with here, and um, we all want to see the game continue. We want to see it flourish, um, but is there a way we can do it where we don't have down the line these superstars that we watch? like to watch playing like Junior Seau, that this because is the outcome. West High, for example, they keep a, a record of the injuries? I'm sure they do. I that, bet they do. That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, for any school. I hadn't thought about I mean, that. If they, it's just, <coughs> they, they, if they analyze it every year. I'm guessing <coughs> if, the tr if the official trainer for the whatever team has to treat a player. Yeah, I'm sure know, they have to keep a, a record. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, insurance probably demands it. Mm -hmm. I just think back to when I was a kid. We didn't have tackle football. and In fact, when I was a kid, I think we only had flag football when I was in eighth grade. That They just started it. And it was fun, but I remember thinking, it's not like the tackle football games we played in the sandlot across yeah. the street. And they were, I mean, <laughs> yeah. there were no helmets or pads or oh, anything, yeah. and we yeah. tackled the living snot out of each other. <laughs> but I don't remember anybody getting their head hurt because we weren't leading with our heads. Right. You know, and of course we were just kids. So and this is a whole other topic, but a big, <clears throat> big issue for me is how do we get that sort of sandlot atmosphere back into these games? Because everything is so structured for the kids these days. So what, yeah. What I'd really like to see Let's this have some fun. This league become you know if we're, we're going to practice once a week and then play a game on a on a Thursday or Friday or whenever. Let's just, when it's the hour out there, let's move it really fast. Let's run games for the kids to play. It's almost like a structured mm. recess in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get, a, and the kids can <laughs> pick their own recess. teams or something. Let's, can we figure out a way where it, it, it's just moving and it's not everybody's putting this guy in this place and it's all these crazy drills. And, and we, I feel like when you, you throw the pad element into it, then it's just three or four more things you got to worry about that detract you from just going out and playing a game yeah. and enjoying it. Now, you're... You're a young man, barely over age 30. When you were a kid growing up, in, did you call buddies up on Saturday or during the summer when you got done with breakfast and say, 
let's go play baseball. Yeah. Let's go play football. You know, did you do that? We did all the time. We had a cool Good. neighborhood with guys. You know, you almost just run and ride your bike over and throw a rock at their door, and yeah. they'll be out in, in a couple yeah. minutes. Yeah. And we did all that fun stuff. You know, we played <laughs> hours on end of yeah, some basketball games sure. in the back. And that's you know, what life all and about. And when it got dark, he played Whatever kick the, the can, you were hide and seek. Yeah. Uh, exactly. You know, the yeah. Olympics were on. We were putting lawn chairs out in the driveway, yeah. and those were our hurdles. And it was I anything and everything. And I, you know, get them out away from. The screen and the iPad oh and the my. TV and what can we do? And if it needs to be a little bit more structured, because that's the way society is today. Mm -hmm. If we got to plan it, then let's structure it. But if it's an hour and a half when ten kids are out there, then let's make sure it's really active and give them some of the say in what they're doing. And well, that's a good point. Get them away from the screen because uh, you don't see kids out playing in neighborhoods like I can't back know. in the day. Have you no, got like any uh, yeah. football fields uh, assigned or like uh, in Coralville uh, is field? We're working on that, and there's—I uh, know Regina has volunteered some of their field space and okay. the university, oh, yeah. and so we're, we want to make sure that we have a variety of different fields all across town. Iowa That's City, Corville, yeah. North Rec Liberty's got all kinds of room to yeah. play anywhere. Rec Center. I, I mean, and, if kids want to get together and mm -hmm. play a pickup game of anything—football, soccer, baseball—the space is available. The green space will be there. You've just yeah. got to get the kids <clears throat> off their get butt them. and get them away from the screen. Yeah. And it yeah. isn't, I can't get my 11 year old boy to do it. He lives in a neighborhood full of kids, and we've got the marching this field right yeah. by our house. Yeah. And uh, you just can't get him. Well, once in a while, you know, once in a while, when somebody's mom is tired of having them hanging around the house, they'll <laughs> kick, start calling. Kick them out the front door. But it's yeah. hard to get, you know, it's hard to, for these kids to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for them to just pick up the phone they don't do that they don't call friends it has to be text or this or that yeah, yeah. but um, it, it, you know they still love to play everything my mm -hmm. boy mm -hmm. he wants to play he, he wrestled this year I mean he wants to do it but it's just a different I guess it's a different era and a different generation. It is, because you can't get them out, out there like what Nate was talking about, right down the street on your bike and get a game going, right, Nate? Yeah. It doesn't happen today. Yeah. I was a TV junkie as a kid, and yeah. I still couldn't wait in the summer when <clears throat> I was down with the paper out and eating breakfast and start making phone calls. And yeah. you'd play till lunchtime, till somebody's mom yelled, come eat, and then you'd say, okay, I'm taking the bat. If you don't bring the ball back, you lose, and we're, you know you're not playing with us in the afternoon. I went to St. Pat's, and we had basketball. Mm -hmm. That's all we had. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I was going to go out with them. I was I, I was a freshman, and I waited for years to, for that opportunity. Yeah. And uh, and I, I went I, and I went out, and that, that had a priest was our. Mm -hmm. Come Would he get everybody together? And yeah, no. He said, "Murph, you can't go out. Oh. <laughs> you, you, you got polio, and yeah. uh, oh, really? and we can't take a, a chance on you. We don't have enough money for insurance. Hmm. Insurance. Well, insurance, and 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 uh, and then I had a lucky break. Uh, uh, that was transferred. Because <laughs> <laughs> you played. I played <laughs> three yeah. years. Yes, you yeah. did. Yeah. Well, yes. The good thing about saying, playing at St. Pat's or St. Mary's back in those days, Murph, is you could go to practice and then go to confession, right? <laughs> <laughs> bless me, Father. I come home yeah. Jimmy and uh, SOB when yeah, you Bless me, Father. Mouth. I had a turnover. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I, I guess I tell the story because <laughs> how important. Uh, 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 youth sports, youth sports, oh, yeah. to, to a uh, young individual. And speaking yes. of that, did you Very see true. what the University of Nebraska football team did the other day? That was really neat. Golly, mm -hmm. they what had a they spring game. I don't uh -huh. know, spring game, spring yeah. practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And out there, I think people just show up. Sixty thousand show up for their, <laughs> you know, just a an unofficial spring practice. But the last play of the simulated game. They brought out a kid who's probably 10 or 11 who's been struggling with brain cancer, and they let him carry the ball, and he scored it on. And wow. I'm telling you, he didn't just score a touchdown. He had a whole train <laughs> of Cornhusker offensive linemen, you know, leading the way, clearing yeah. a path, 
And then they picked him up in the end zone, carried <laughs> him all around. That made oh. that made national. It made international news. Yeah, Hills everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, oh my goodness, that's terrific. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I I don't hate Nebraska as much as I used to. <laughs> <laughs> well, come November, you probably oh, will. Oh, I'm gonna hate them. <laughs> uh, I, I want to keep talking about the Red Zone Academy, yeah. but one thing that just struck my mind. Um, I'm a Facebook friend with John Lazar, who was the fullback for the Hawkeyes when I was in school. Mm -hmm. From Tame Isle. From Tame Isle, and he was a tough son of a gun. He was. And I'm a friend of his. He, he, yeah, <laughs> he posted the other day that he saw some Michigan, former Michigan State football player who played against him um, <clears throat> had died. Hmm. And he said something about Big Ten brethren. Now, I... I I'll admit, I have gotten to the point where I just don't like any of the Big Ten teams. <laughs> I, I just, you know, maybe it's familiarity, familiar, familiarity breeds contempt. But you're a former player. Uh, you can't possibly feel the, the way I do. <laughs> <laughs> you do, I mean, especially in the NFL locker room. We tend to uh -huh. stick together a little bit, and we had a lot of neat, some of our offensive linemen, one was from Indiana, one was from Purdue, and mm -hmm. you tend to gravitate towards each yeah. other a little bit. Big Ten brethren. Yeah, because yeah, so. you got to stick up mm -hmm. against all those SEC guys. I That's mean, right. Exactly. Or they'll, they'll talk you to death, and they'll That's right. constantly remind you how many national titles they've won the last 20 years, which they have a good point there, but we they, they tend to stick together, and there's some mutual respect there, and uh, but there isn't isn't a conference with more history than what they have in the Big Ten. No, yeah, no. Well, let's get back to the Red Zone Academy again. Uh, and before I forget, there is a website that people can go to if you have questions about it. Uh, and of course, I've lost my place. Nate, do you know the web address? It should just, it's, it's in conjunction with Diamond Dreams, the sports academy over it there in the, in the River Landing. So the and yeah. Brian Mitchell and some of those guys run that. Mm -hmm. And so they're just out there last night. Yeah, they're trying to organize the a football appendage of that of that sports academy, which is great. If you just went to DiamondDreams.com, uh, there should be a, a link on there for the Red Zone Football League. Now, is your intention, Nate? I mean, here we are, almost you know, middle of April. Is your intention to? Try to get this red started for this coming. Yeah, we've already got uh, okay. insurance mm -hmm. through the USA Football and the NFL flag, and the registration is all okay. funneled through NFL flag. So they give you a bunch of support system to, to handle the registration and all that. So the good. the hope is to at least introduce it this fall and get a good good group of kids out, and then uh, continue to build it and shape it and mold it. And mm -hmm. like any startup, whether it's a business or anything else, it's going to take a little bit of time to get it done. Yeah. Um, but our our main objective is to. And the rec leagues do a great job. They offer some good introductory programs. But this will kind of be the little more, more uh, I don't want to say advanced, but um, maybe some more expert instruction with, with Tyler and his professional staff on board. So maybe a, a bump up of from the rec league and from the rec league flag, and then uh, but certainly not with the tackle component in it for the for the third and fourth graders. Um, yeah. Um, initially. You mentioned Tyler. Tyler Bloom, former Hawkeye football, football player. Football player, and he's mm -hmm. the one that's running the Red Zone Football Academy. Mm -hmm. um, if you want more information, you can go to simply redzoneacademy.com. Red Zone, I'm sorry, redzonefootballacademy.com. Uh, Twitter, it is Red Zone Academy. Or you have your Facebook page, too, yep. Red Zone Academy. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, Red Zone Football Academy. And the idea, again, is to make football safe and fun for third and fourth and fifth and sixth graders, at, at least, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. even more. Uh, it looks like the Press Citizen, their website has got a question that they're asking people to answer. And simply, uh, they want to know, uh, when is the right time and uh, when is it appropriate for children to start playing tackle football? Is it third or fourth grade? Is it fifth or sixth grade, seventh grade, or not at all? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be interested to see what some people say. Um, um, what else uh, do you want to talk? I mean, the kids, I think, would be just super excited to wear an NFL degree. Yeah, there's what some it means cool, to my boys. Some yeah. cool components to it. And, um, you know, Coach Sabres had some really good points. We spent a, a, a good couple hours talking with him about it, and mm -hmm. there isn't anyone more knowledgeable than, than what he is, especially with the with the youth and the high school level. Yeah. And he brought up some great points. He still wants to make sure that we're teaching the the physicality of the game. So he's, you know, let's play some tug of war or like a little sumo wrestling. So some ways you can kind of engage or lock up on a guy, and and, and you can still be physical because that's always going to be a key component of football. That's why we all like it. That's why the kids like to play it. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. I liked it back when I wasn't going up against a bunch of three hundred pounders <laughs> in, in high school. It's 
of fun. <laughs> and, you know, there's a safe way to do it, but let's it teach, the, let's introduce the physicality to it. Do create a bunch of fun games where you you're, you're running around, you're locking up with somebody, pushing them around. The uh, there's there's neat <coughs> ways to do that, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put all of our brains together and, and get these 10, 15, 20, 30 drills that the parents can then go put the kids through in a little bag of goodies where they can they can go make it happen. And he brought up another good point. He, he said that he always preaches this to all his football players. And I know Coach Barrett says the same thing when they're mm -hmm. trying to recruit a high school kid. And I feel like some parents get lost in this a little bit. If you want to be a great football player, go play other sports. Because if your kid's the center on the football team, then he should be a, a wrestler or he should mm -hmm. be throwing the shot put. Or he should be, yeah. uh, you know, a power forward on the basketball team. And that's what Coach Ferentz and, and Coach Morgan and the guys at Iowa know this for a fact. That's what they look for. They oh, want to yeah. see the multi-sport guys. How do they handle that team dynamic? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if he's a defensive back and the, the anchor leg in the in the four by four hundred relay, is he working with his teammates? Is he cheering them on? Uh, is he, you know? And they can also see the physical skills that transfer over into football as well. And that's what Coach Sabers really really pounded away at was. Let you know what get the league at six weeks in the fall, but let's allow for a lot of other time for these kids as they're young to play four or five different sports or mm -hmm. three sports, and those different those other sports are going to make them good football yeah. players in the end as well. If they're yeah. th he doesn't want the guys going in there. I'm just going to be a tackle football player. It's all I'm going to do for the, I'm done playing athletics. He, he wants them to play a lot of different things, and this football should be the fun part of it. Just get out and run around and and uh, and be part of the game. <clears throat> when will the league uh, begin? And the league is slated to begin, uh, I believe, end of August, early September. And like I said, it'll just be a, uh, right now it's a six week schedule. You play six games. What day do they play on? That's yet to be determined once okay. we figure out the, the fields and we get some feedback from the parents and start to register. And uh, I'm sure there are going to be a few a few roadblocks early just in terms of this thing up and, and where are all the different teams coming from. That's and, life. Yeah, but it's, that's the way it's going to be. And, yeah. uh, but I think it's, and that's football, yeah. roadblocks. Mm -hmm. And it teaches you to overcome. All kinds of adversity. I think what you've done, I know you've won over Marv Cook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, be, be, because I think if I remember from the Monday morning quarterback luncheon, even then, you, I don't know if you'd heard from Marv at that point. Yeah, we had met with, we actually met with Marv that afternoon. Is that right? Yeah. Because when I read about his comments, I thought, boy, you know. Yeah. Now You've got momentum. I think there's some good partnerships and collaboration there as well uh, with the with the rec leagues. They have great attendance at North Liberty yeah. and Coralville, all their oh, flag yeah. football yeah. leagues. And Mar Marv Cook's really bright. Yes, he yeah. is. Marv's great. Uh, Regina, he's talked about uh, you know collaborating with what we're doing with their third and fourth graders and fifth graders. And so, at the very least, if this gets people talking about it and yeah. and, it, and it helps the game and it helps the safety of the yeah. game. And he's got two boys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He talked about that in the Press Citizen. They've already been through the tackle portion. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if he had others, they wouldn't have. You know, they would have played flag, and they would have started yeah. in seventh grade. Um, you, I'm guessing, since you brought this to the attention of this community, you've heard from a lot of people. Yeah, we have, and it's uh, it, the feedback has has been good. Especially, you know, I don't I don't ever want to come from the position where I'm telling someone else to do it with their own kids. It's simply me. No. Me, uh, I think you're not doing br that. Though. Bringing bringing some uh, my 18 years of experience <laughs> as a high school and collegiate and professional player, and I think I. Uh, opinion carries some weight, especially mm -hmm. having gone through what I've done, and I think yeah. I owe it to the community to to, to voice my opinion and all the right um, reasons, Nate. Uh, right. I've got a little bit of an educator's bone in my body as well. I you know went through the College of Ed and got my teaching certification, and so I mean I've, I've, I think part of this is an education piece and, and continuing to to challenge the people that we give our children into their care to mm -hmm. to make sure that they're thinking through what they're doing. So uh, we've got just a couple minutes left. You want to tell us about your kids, uh, your family? Uh, three kids now, my wife and I. <laughs> she's, a, she's a Marshalltown girl. She's an Iowa girl. And we got uh, two boys, Jack, and who's four and a half, and Wyatt, who's three, and a little girl, Tess. And they, uh, the two boys especially, are just nuts. They, <laughs> so they, they, they're, they're, a, they're a handful, but they're fun. Now, but you're it, a West High grad. <laughs> Living in Iowa City, are you in the Iowa City? Or I'm, a, City I'm, a, High I'm on the Little Hawk. I'm on the Little Hawk side now. Uh, so I'm, uh, uh, oh, uh, yeah, I'm over there, but it's. Uh, <laughs> I pulled the mic. The mic gate. Yeah. But, uh, 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 but no, I mean, uh, when you leave, you really come back and you understand how just how great it's. It's apples and oranges. Uh, that's right. They're they're both both outstanding schools, and you know I know Jerry Arkenbright for <laughs> forever. Obviously, he's outstanding, and I've gotten to know John Bacon over the last year or so, and oh, he's a great he guy. is he's a great guy. Oh. Super energetic. Yep. Two great, great schools, 
two great programs for athletics up and down the board mm -hmm. and I like apples and I like oranges yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know you talk about a big sports fan yeah John Bacon yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a hawk here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Jerry Argenbright on mm -hmm. uh, just before, was it just after he retired? Mm -hmm. Or Marv, Marv Ryland? Or Marv Ryland. Yeah, yeah. Jerry Argenbright. I'm sorry. Yeah. Jeez. Marv, I mean, what a what oh, a yeah. legend he is. <laughs> and he's a nice guy. Great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you'd be a, you watch those guys, how much they work. All the different, I mean, how many days a week are they not mm -hmm. yeah. opening up a gym or shutting a gate to a football game or a soccer game, it's amazing. And I don't think anybody can fully appreciate that except their spouses. You know, yes. uh, a lot of times you see their spouses with them at the yeah. different games and yeah. events. And City High just lost Deanne Kramer. Mm -hmm. uh, where'd she go? Pleasant Valley, mm -hmm. I think. I and, so, uh, yeah. and they've got, uh, who's their new athletic director, former? Uh, He's from the staff, yeah. City High staff. Yeah, center. I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. But anyway. Joe, how are we doing on time, my friend? We've got four, three, three. two, or is that just the middle? Okay. Three, three. <laughs> um, so, Nate, you're headed from here down to uh, back to the press citizen to talk yeah, to we're the advisory. Yeah, we're going to talk meet with the editorial, editorial board, board and uh, um, just kind of fill them in. I'm trying to get them connected with some folks at the UI Sports Medicine, some of the local pediatric doctors, just for them to sort of yeah, weigh in on great. on their opinion, yeah. and because um, that some a lot of the medical stuff is certainly over my over my head but um, I think it's great that they've they've taken on the issue what about personally. Kirk Ferentz uh, have you talked to him about it I haven't had a chance to talk to Kirk yet about it um, I know I've talked to to coach Morgan and coach Doyle and, and they're all for uh, you know just a, a tactful approach to, to how the game mm -hmm. is introduced and um, yeah I mean it's, it's amazing at how how many people don't see the the, the, the reasoning behind kids that young tackling they don't get what what actually does it accomplish um, and it yeah, I think, I think it's a, a good ongoing debate, and I think the press citizens done a great thing by taking it on. Well, I think it's I think you've done a great thing by taking it on and championing championing this effort here in the mm -hmm. Iowa City Coralville. Got to have me uh, on again and, and uh, have me said how, how uh, far you. Up. Yeah, exactly. We'd love to have me yeah. back. Uh, come back next year and see how the first year went. Yeah, and yeah. take well, some okay. parent feedback and yeah. come back to you. I think you've made day. a lot of parents, moms and dads, happy with the this option mm -hmm. for their children. I think there are plenty of them who don't want their kids to play tackle. I think especially moms, this is oh, a, yeah. this will be a well received. Yeah. Well guys, we're out of time. Yeah. Nate, want to thank you very much Thanks for, for having being me here today. Mm -hmm. We thank also you. want to wish you best of luck in Tampa Bay. Thank you. And uh, we'll be following you all the way as we have been since you were at West Tide. Kick them all awesome. straight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Tell your mom and Thank dad you, and everybody hi. We, uh, again, really appreciate you being here. On behalf of Bob Boyd and Earl Murphy, I'm Dirk Keller thanking Nate Kading for being here as our special guest on Sports Opinion. Our show can be seen every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on Channel 18 and every Sunday mm -hmm. at 6 p.m. You can also catch it at this website here, patv.tv. It doesn't work for you. Go to my Facebook page. i got every show up there. And uh, maybe I'll put it on Nate's page, too, okay? <laughs> and on behalf of everybody here, I want to thank you for watching. And remember, either you're a hawk or you're not. Go Hawks. Amen. There you go. <laughs>